Well, Donald Trump has many bad days ahead of him as criminal defendant Trump. None will be more painful than the days he spends in Winston Chutkin's daughter's courtroom. Winston Chutkin told the New York Times that when he won a scholarship to go to high school in Jamaica, quote, I wore shoes and experienced indoor plumbing for the first time in my life. Winston Chutkin worked very hard, did very well in high school. He went on to become an orthopedic surgeon, one of Jamaica's most prominent physicians. When his daughter, Tanya, arrived in Washington from Jamaica at age 17 to attend George Washington University, she fell in love with the city and has lived there ever since, except for her three years as a distinguished student at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, where she was an editor of the Law Review. Tanya's younger sister and brother both followed in their father's footsteps and became physicians. Tanya Chutkin served as a public defender in Washington, D.C., where she married another public defender and had two children. She then became a highly compensated member of a large Washington law firm. President Obama appointed Tanya Chutkin to a federal judgeship in 2014. Her appointment was confirmed by the United States Senate 95 to nothing. She told her sister then, I've never been so excited to receive a pay cut. Tanya Chutkin knows that Donald Trump thinks her blood is poison and that her children's blood is poison. Donald Trump says that immigrants like Tanya Chutkin are poisoning the blood of America, a phrase Donald Trump has lifted directly from Adolf Hitler. But the proof that Judge Chutkin bears no judicial prejudice against Donald Trump whatsoever came today in the form of a Court of Appeals opinion and order that affirmed every single word Judge Tanya Chutkin wrote in her 48-page opinion in December denying Donald Trump's claim of immunity for any crimes he committed while president. Judge Chutkin's opinion said that the presidency, quote, does not confer a lifelong get-out-of-jail-free pass. There were many winners today when the Court of Appeals opinion was issued. Special Prosecutor Jack Smith and his brilliant legal team, the framers of the Constitution, with Alexander Hamilton being specifically quoted in the opinion supporting criminal prosecutions of former presidents. The American people who believe in the rule of law were very big winners today, and the people who believe in Donald Trump were once again, like Donald Trump himself, big losers today. But the individual biggest winner of the day was Judge Tanya Chutkin, whose work was studied line by line, word by word, by Donald Trump's lawyers who tried to rip it apart in arguments to a three-judge panel of the Court of Appeals. And each of those judges, including a conservative Republican appointed judge who has hired law clerks who are members of the Federalist Society, agreed unanimously agreed that Judge Chutkin was right in every word she wrote, every word. And so the day is going to come when Donald Trump stands trial in Judge Chutkin's courtroom, where every day he will be looking up at a judge who he has publicly, personally insulted by calling her a racist and hurling other insults at her. And he will be looking up at a judge who he has accused, along with every other immigrant who Donald Trump didn't marry, of poisoning the blood of America. And every day Donald Trump sits in that courtroom looking up at Judge Chutkin, he will be looking at her with raging hatred that he will not be allowed to express in that courtroom. And we, he will be looking at her in abject fear, which he will admit to no one. The appeals court announced at the beginning of their opinion that they were siding with Judge Chutkin's denial of Donald Trump's immunity, the appeal, uh, claim of immunity. The appeals court wrote, today we affirm the denial for the purpose of this criminal case, former President Trump has become citizen Trump. The Court of Appeals knocked down every Trump argument on immunity, saying we cannot accept former President Trump's claim that a president has unbounded authority to commit crimes that would neutralize the most fundamental check on executive power, the recognition and implementation of election results, nor can we sanction his apparent contention that the executive has carte blanche 
to violate the rights of individual citizens to vote and to have their votes count. The unanimous appeals court decision used the Trump lawyers' arguments about the impeachment clause against them, saying the strongest evidence against former President Trump's claim of immunity is found in the impeachment clause because it specifies that presidents, quote, shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to law. The Court of Appeals swept away the Trump claim that criminal prosecution now would amount to double jeopardy after he was tried in a Senate impeachment trial on a similar charge. The court said an impeachment does not result in criminal punishments and the indictment does not charge the same offense as the single count in the impeachment resolution. The court crushed the Trump argument that a former president can only be prosecuted after being found guilty in, of the same charge in a Senate impeachment trial. The court quoted an early member of Congress in 1798 saying, whether a person tried under an impeachment be found guilty or acquitted, he is still liable to a prosecution at common law. The court said it would be a striking paradox if the president who alone is vested with the constitutional duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed were the sole officer capable of defying those laws with impunity. Four weeks ago, Donald Trump sat in the Court of Appeals hearing room looking up at the three women judges who heard this case, Judge Karen Henderson, Judge Florence Pan, and Judge Michelle Childs. There was no legal reason for him to be in the room. Donald Trump is, of course, profoundly stupid, but still not stupid enough to think that his eyes or his hair or his makeup or his red necktie would intimidate those judges. And surely the dark, twisted coils of Donald Trump's brain were still able to process the obvious fact that these three women had complete control over him in this proceeding. They ended their unanimous opinion on page 57 today with a fully researched and authoritative pronouncement that unsurprisingly reflects everything we heard them say in the courtroom that day, looking down at Donald Trump. Quote, we have balanced former President Trump's asserted interests in executive immunity against the vital public interests that favor allowing this prosecution to proceed. We conclude that concerns of public policy, especially as illuminated by our history and the structure of our government, compel the rejection of this claim of immunity in this case. We also have considered his contention that he is entitled to categorical, categorical immunity from criminal liability for any assertedly official action that he took as president, a contention that is unsupported by precedent, history, or the text and structure of the Constitution. Finally, we are unpersuaded by his argument that this prosecution is barred by double jeopardy principles. Accordingly, the order of the district court is affirmed. So ordered. Neil, I, I want to begin with you as the appellate uh, expert here, and I would not presume to uh, focus you with the question. I just want to have us all listen to your reaction to what you think are the important points of this opinion. Well, I think that we could very well, Lawrence, be looking at the very last words about Trump's claim about absolute immunity from criminal prosecution. And we could be looking at words that will likely force Donald Trump to go to a criminal trial for the January 6th insurrection and, most importantly, have that trial before the presidential election, which makes a lot of sense because the American people deserve to know exactly what happened on that day. And to me, like, this decision shows our legal system at its best. You got three judges with dramatically different political views, dramatically different judicial philosophies. They come together. They produce this brilliant, methodical, timely opinion. It's a model of good judging. I've always felt there's a difference between law and politics. Judge Henderson is on this case. She's a very conservative jurist. She voted against Donald Trump just as much as the other two judges. And it reminds me of, like, you know, kind of those historic votes that are cast. I remember Jeffrey Sutton, who was up for on the short list for the Supreme Court, very conservative just judge, upholds President Obama's Affordable Care Act, uh, the first judge to, you know, so-called cross party lines. This is what it's about. I mean, no presidential get out of jail free card in our Constitution. This is the essence of what American democracy is. And I do not think, and we can talk about this more later, 
I don't think the Supreme Court's going to touch this with a 10-foot pole. Uh, Neil, uh, talk about it right now in terms of what do you think the elements uh, of the opinion, uh, which ones carry the strength that will make uh, the Supreme Court feel the job is done? They don't need us. I think the most important piece is constitutional structure, just that our entire system is basically a rebellion against King George III and the idea that people can be above the law in our system. There's lots of small points that are made. Some of them are really good, like, you know, Donald Trump himself said in his second impeachment, his lawyers said, you know, don't impeach him because he can be criminally prosecuted. And now he's turning around and saying, oh, I can't be criminally prosecuted because I was a former president. There's lots of small things like that. But to me, the ultimate thing is Donald Trump is citizen Trump. That's the way the opinion ends. And that's like a fundamental principle in our Anglo-American system of government. No person's above the law. Everyone is treated equally. It's what the words on the top of the Supreme Court say, equal protection under law. And that's what this decision is all about. It's why I don't think the Supreme Court will take this case. Uh, Andrew, I have to say, in reading it, there's a lot of things I didn't know. I didn't know about that congressman who <laughs> said this 200 years ago. I didn't really know the Marbury versus Madison linkage to any of this. So there it is. So there's a lot of illumination about historical detail. But there's not a single surprise. There's nothing surprising about it at all. This is the country I thought I was living in. Yeah, so there's something incredibly affirming about this, but I think one of the reasons Neil and I and many, many others um, were not surprised by this is the claims that Donald Trump was making are completely unfounded. There, there's no precedent for them. This is one where everyone says, oh, Donald Trump is unprecedented. In a court of law, that's not very good. Um, you need to have precedent on your side. He didn't. I would like to focus on Donald Trump is fond of saying publicly and walking back his claim, I'm only going to be a dictator for a day. Mm -hmm. I didn't really mean it. It's only one day. Look at the decision in terms of what Donald Trump is saying. It's not one day. He is, his claims, these are not abstract. He is saying, I am, as a, when I become president, he is saying, I am, should have the unbounded authority to commit crimes. I should not have the check of an electorate to remove me. Um, at, at the quote from the, the court is, at bottom, former President Trump's stance would collapse our system of separated powers by placing the president beyond the reach of all three branches. That is a claim to the D.C. Circuit of being a dictator, that that is what he wants. This idea that, it's, oh, I didn't really mean it, it's only for a day. No, he tried to get the D.C. Circuit to go along with that. Um, so, of course, that was going to be rejected. But to me is preposterous is that this is somebody who's actually a serious candidate to run for office when he's running on something that you now have a, a unanimous decision saying this is fundamentally his view is fundamentally antithetical to the American system of justice. I just want to open your mic to your reflections on on this opinion. And I actually, I'd like to begin with this, because I know you approach this with a cool professionalism and evaluating it as any scientist would looking through a microscope in a laboratory at each one of these words. But what did you feel? What did you feel today when you were turning the pages of this opinion? I felt pride that law still means something in this country, that it's not all politics. I felt pride that finally arguments that made no sense, that we all knew could not prevail, were systematically and yet politely dissected and basically left on the cutting room floor. What I also felt was a bit of dismay because in an ordinary world, it wouldn't really have given Trump an opportunity to delay the start of the trial. Trial that was to have begun in Judge Chutkin's court on March the 4th. Why was it delayed? Not because there was some serious legal doubt 
about the proposition that no one is above the law, not that any of Trump's arguments had merit, but because the system is so designed that, in all fairness, even a frivolous argument for absolute immunity has to be considered at the outset, because if it were true that the president was immune from trial the way one would be if there were a double jeopardy claim of the kind he foolishly tried to make, then having the trial would destroy that right before you could vindicate it. So the court methodically went through all of this. It took a month to write a brilliant opinion. That doesn't surprise me. It doesn't even bother me. What bothers me is the thought that now, even with the acceleration of the process, where the court says you have to seek a stay by Monday, otherwise we're going to be back on track. Despite all of that, we still wonder what's going to happen. I agree with the predictions of most of my colleagues, with Neil and, and uh, with Al Weissman. I agree that it's unlikely the court will hear the case. And in an ordinary world, it would have no reason to hear it. There was no serious argument. The decision is bulletproof. There's no basis for thinking it would ever be reversed. And yet, if there are five votes on this court to delay and thereby create the possibility that he won't be tried before the election, if there are five votes to do that, there will be a stay. I don't think it'll happen. But what does it say about the current Supreme Court and its eagerness to get its hands on everything, to have the last word on everything? that we aren't sure. What does it say that we have to wait till Monday, watch to see if a stay is granted? If the court were performing its functions in general, as well as these three judges did, we wouldn't worry for a moment. We would know that the court would give the back of its hand to any request for a stay. But it is the very fact that we don't know, and the very fact that tens of millions of our fellow citizens find appealing the idea of someone who says, I couldn't do my job if I had to worry about whether I was committing a crime. The fact that we have millions of people who imagine putting that person into power, that scares me and it upsets me. And that's one of the things that moved me as I read this. I thought, here on the one hand, we have real law, and on the other hand, we have utter lawlessness, chaos, narcissism, selfishness, and a country that just might put that back into power. And so I was of two minds. So uh, two things here. Uh, one is, is the word president enough? Is that enough for the Supreme Court uh, simply to reach down and take this case, the fact that the word president appears in the case? And then secondly, we saw the Supreme Court act in 16 days on the, on the case involving Richard Nixon. There's a history here when the word president is involved uh, where the Supreme Court has acted with lightning speed. That's true. And it acted with lightning speed when Truman seized the steel mm -hmm. mills. Mm -hmm. It acted very quickly. In fact, it leapfrogged the Court of Appeals and did what it declined to do in this case. It was asked to take the case away from the Court of Appeals and decide it quickly itself? It didn't. It waited for the Court of Appeals. But the question you asked, is the word president enough? It may be. A court that sees itself as having the last word on everything of importance, every major question is to be decided by the court and not by expert agencies. That kind of court might think, well, if it's the president, then we, the Supreme Court, have got to have the final word. That It's not a healthy system in which we don't know what's going to happen in that circumstance.